Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much uh, for making it here today. This is a very special version of the Youth Participation Practice Network meeting. It's doubling up as a digital youth work webinar. My name is Sam. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the youth participation and, and sector development worker at YACVIC, the Youth Affairs Council, Victoria. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm zooming in from today and pay my respects to the Boonarung people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, and extend that respect to anybody who identifies as Aboriginal in the Zoom here today. Um, I'd also like to note that sovereignty was never ceded um, by any First Nations people across this island. Um, and the neighbouring islands. And therefore we're on stolen land to this day, um, living, working and profiting from that stolen land. I'd like to acknowledge that the ongoing, the continuing connection to country and culture for Aboriginal people um, and make reference to the, the Black Lives Matter movement as well. Um, I'd like to stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement um, as, as is Yakvik, um, we are reflecting on the practices that we're using um, and the representation that we have across the organisation and the position that we have in that conversation. Um, and I'd like to highlight the disgraceful numbers of deaths in custody for Aboriginal people in the last 30 years since the Royal Commission. Um, finally, in terms of an acknowledgement of country, I'd like to also um, Pay my respects to Bunjil, the spirit creator. Bunjil, the wedge-tailed eagle um, in um, Kulin uh, Dreamtime story talks about looking after two specific things. Bunjil's law names caring for country and caring for children. Um, and I think that is a great thing for us to remember. Um, sitting on Kulin land specifically, uh, as I do, um, I'd like to remember um, that young, the young ones are the future um, and the care that we offer and provide um, can help to nurture uh, as we go. Um, this was a piece of participatory art that was created at the Koori Youth Summit um, in 2017, I believe. Uh, those feathers show the hopes and dreams of the participants at the summit. Um, it's a beautiful piece of, of artwork that sits in the Yakvik office. Um, and we're very privileged and, and lucky to co-locate and auspice the Koori Youth Council as part of Yakvik's bigger structure. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here today. Um, I'm really excited. We have two great speakers talking about two very different approaches to digital youth work. Um, the first, uh, and so the first speaker is James Harris, um, who I will introduce shortly. And uh, following James, we have Emily as well. Um, so James set up um, youthwork.io, um, has created a digital youth work framework, um, and is running some great online professional development and networking for youth workers across the world. Um, pretty inspiring stuff. Um, and Emily's worked on the recent creation and, and launch of the virtual Y youth space. Um, so obviously that's super topical right now, whilst we're all working online, um, it's something that the YPPN has been talking about for a little while as well. So what's gonna happen today, it's gonna be a little bit different. We've got a hybrid model going on today, folks. So strap yourselves in. The first hour is kind of standard webinar format, I guess. We're gonna be live streaming on Facebook. It's being recorded and will be shared after and posted on our YouTube channel. So um, if you don't wanna be seen in that webinar, I would suggest that you turn your video off now um, and maybe turn it on towards the end when we stop streaming. So after the first hour or so, I reckon we'll go till about four or four or five, maybe um, with the webinar format, the presentations and the Q&A's. And then after that, we'll, we'll kick into a kind of more standard YPPN meeting where we break into breakout groups um, and we'll have some time for discussion and networking, a chance to meet some people who are part of the, the YPPN um, and, and discuss what we've learned about today as well. We'll come back into the big group towards the end. Um, and we will be able to debrief, talk about what we've discussed, um, maybe do some shout outs if anyone's got any events or opportunities that are coming up as well. So hopefully you're all here for the right 
thing. You've all come for the Digital Youth Work webinar. Um, those that are live streaming will be here for the first hour or so. Everybody that's here in the Zoom call is welcome then to stay on until about half past four. Um, what do you need to know about Zoom? If you're brand new to Zoom, um, which most of you won't be, you can um, change the name that appears on your screen. So if you've got some um, kooky username, it's quite handy to be able to change your name to your name, um, maybe your organization and potentially your pronouns as well. You can do that by hovering over your image. The top right hand corner has got three little dots. If you click on that and then hit rename, um, you can change your name, um, which is quite empowering. Um, we've got the chat box that you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen or under the more option. Um, if you're participating on a tablet um, or whatever. Um, I think that's about it. You can turn your video on and off. There's no questions asked. The first half, as I say, is a webinar. So you don't need to have your video on. You're welcome to just have um, the sound playing um, and listen to the great presentations. Um, if you want to fire in some questions um, to ask to our presenters, you can do that through the chat box. And you could also take yourself off mute when we get to that point and, and ask them directly. So I think that's about it for what you need to know about Zoom, really. Um, a quick intro to Yakvik, anybody that's brand new to Yakvik. Yakvik is the Youth Affairs Council, Victoria. So we're the state peak body for young people um, and the sector that supports them. We work in the best interest of young people, um, supporting their human rights and their voice on um, policy and advocacy. Um, we run training, we run events, we run um, a series of programs, often in partnership with other organizations. What's the YPPN? Anyone that's new to the YPPN? Um, I mean, it is probably the worst acronym out there and there are some pretty bad acronyms. So um, I never get used to saying the YPPN. But anyway, Youth Participation Practice Network um, is, an, is a kind of community of practice for those working in youth participation and engagement. So um, we, we, meet up, we meet up every month. We have done during lockdown. Usually it's a little less frequent than that. We come together, we network, we share practice. We try and find solutions to common challenges. We share resources um, and share opportunities across Victoria. Um, if that sounds like something you'd like to be involved in long term, um, feel free to put in the chat box that you'd like to join um, and we'll try and connect with you or, or send an email through to me or my colleague Naria. Um, Naria uh, is managing the chat box. She works alongside me um, at Yakvik in, in participation and events. And so feel free to ask her any questions that you might have today as well about Yakvik or about the webinar, yada, yada. Um, as I say, there'll be times for questions. We'll do that after each presenter. So we'll hand over to James in just a moment and then we'll get some questions in for him. And then Emily's gonna present, we'll get some questions for her um, and hopefully it will work super smoothly. Um, as I say, if you've got any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box as well. Um, just another reminder that we're recording today, um, so pop yourself, um, pop your camera off if you don't want to be seen in that. Um, it will be live streaming and we'll sit on Facebook after today um, and we'll also upload it to YouTube. We'll send out the presentations that James and Emily speak to along with the um, link to the recording to everybody that's registered today. So if you've got colleagues that you were hoping would be here, um, let them know that they can follow along after the fact as well. I reckon that's it. Um, I reckon we're good to go. Um, so what I'd like to do at this point is to introduce James Harris. Um, he's a youth worker and founder of youthwork.io, um, which is essentially a digital youth work space. He's the creator of the digital youth work, a practical non-techie guide, um, which I can vouch for and has been incredibly useful as I've adapted my work to um, online environment. He's a proud Kiwi. He's worked with young people internationally. Um, and I attended his Digital Youth Work Summit at the beginning of lockdown, um, and it's been quite an inspiration through the challenging times that we've had, um, and has definitely given me um, tools and, and ideas and, and confidence to work in, in the way that um, Yakvik has in an online space as well. So I'm really excited that he's able to be here, uh, calling in from WA, I believe. I will pass over to James. Thanks so much, James. And I'll give you a two minute warning, um, mate, towards the end. Perfect. Hey everyone, I'll just get my um, screen ready to share. Can everybody see that? We good? I'm gonna 
start my timer so I know exactly how long I've been talking for. It is so good to uh, be joining this call. I'm really excited. Before I start, uh, we've already had an acknowledgement of country, but I think it's important um, for me to do the same as I'm uh, currently on Jaru and Gugaja land. So I wanna pay my respects to the elders here, uh, both past, the amazing present elders we have that give so much to the young people here and the elders emerging as well that, um, that I have the privilege to work alongside. So um, I wanna acknowledge uh, country here, but also all the countries we're meeting on as well. Uh, yeah, I am a proud Kiwi who is married uh, to an Australian Aboriginal woman. Uh, and we moved back to Australia to be able to connect deeper into country, which took us out to Belgo, which is a remote community in Western Australia. Um, and I identify as he, him. I'm gonna be doing a real crash course on applying some of the lessons that I learned from running a successful drop-in center and how that can help transfer into the online world. So um, we'll kick into it. Firstly to say is that uh, we're gonna quickly go through why digital youth work, why would we do that? Uh, some of those lessons from a successful drop-in and then creating some aims for digital youth work. I think with anything, any youth work activity, you wanna know exactly why you're doing it and what success looks like. So uh, creating some aims and I'm gonna quickly share a framework and I'll give you a place to go for any more information. Very, very quickly, a bit about me. As I've already said, I'm a proud Kiwi. Uh, been overseas for a while, but I was previously with Zeal Wellington, uh, which is, Zeal is an amazing creative organization in New Zealand. Last year, I had the privilege of being uh, in Jordan, uh, which included taking a bunch of Syrian and Jordanian young people to meet with uh, the European Parliament, which was a crazy opportunity and amazing to see those voices coming together to speak truth to power. It was really amazing. Uh, so this is my wife and I in Jordan, and this is my new life now uh, in Belgo, a remote community in Jaru and Gugaja land uh, in Western Australia. So why digital youth work? The first thing to say is that as strength-based partitioners, we acknowledge that young people have a whole load of risk factors in their lives. Uh, here are some examples that, you know, young person might be from a single parent home, have learning difficulties, have uh, simple or complex trauma, um, parents struggling to make rent, but actually adding on to that, uh, someone's town or city being on lockdown and the whole COVID-19 situation in, its of, in and of itself is a risk factor for young people. And pre-COVID, young people as strength-based as strength-based practitioners, sorry, say that quickly ten times. Um, as strength-based practitioners, uh, we know that young people have uh, uh, have protective factors that balance with those. So they may be in a sports team or attend activities at a local youth centre. They have a good connection with a local youth worker, and that these by building up these strengths, we build up the young person's resilience to the risk factors in their life. But as we hit uh, the COVID-19 lockdown and in the reality that we're living in and moving through at the moment, uh, we know that a lot of those protective factors were wiped out. All of a sudden, sport wasn't happening. All of a sudden, the youth center wasn't open. Uh, and I, still in here, we have close peer connections from the youth center that maybe would have carried on, but I want to speak to later on how they may have even changed during lockdown. Uh, so that really is the why of digital youth work is all of a sudden, uh, all of these protective factors that were in young people's lives were removed. So we wanted to do what we can and we want to do what we can to increase those protective factors as strengths-based practitioners. So I just wanted to quickly share some lessons uh, from running a successful drop-in center and how that has sort of impacted on digital youth work and some ideas that I think are helpful to take on from there. So this is me and the team at Zeal Wellington. We ran 
a creative youth center that uh, taught photography and art and uh, young people came in and made zines and all sorts of cool stuff. And uh, you can see on the wall, uh, this is for our, the opening of the youth center. We broke up a bike we, and we broke the cycle. Uh, and it was a piece of art by young people talking about breaking the cycle of youth unemployment. Anyway, I thought that was cool. Um, but yeah, so I spent uh, about seven years working for Zeal, which was awesome. All of that uh, running these sort of creative drop-ins. One of the big learnings from that time is that one thing that young people really need is consistent, predictable routine. So it's easily remembered as CPR, consistent, predictable routine. And I want to share a story really quickly uh, that talks about that. This is uh, me with an amazing and resilient young guy that he spent a, um, a lot of his life uh, either sleeping rough or homeless and sleeping on different couches wherever he could. And he was able to really push through that adversity. And one thing that we were able to do at the youth centre that helped is that um, we were able to provide some consistent, predictable routine for him. So he joined our barista program and started learning how to make coffee and actually ended up working for a social enterprise cafe that we had. Um, and with him, it was a 15 week program every Wednesday afternoon for a couple of hours. And of the, of the 10 young people, he was the one person that made it every week. And so we had an agreement with him that if he made his way to the youth center, he could do the course and we'd drop him back to wherever he was staying at that time. And it was all over. If anyone here knows Wellington, Wellington is a grouping of other cities of that, you know, there's sort of four cities and he was staying across all different cities. Uh, but we had this agreement and this consistent predictable routine for him that if he just had to make his way there throughout the day, we could get him to where, wherever he was gonna sleep that night. Uh, and he was able to finish up the barista course and start working in the cafe, uh, which was really awesome. And I think that points to, uh, young people who often have real inconsistencies in their life. Uh, for him, life was completely unpredictable. He didn't really know where he would be sleeping night to night. Uh, and any sense of routine was sort of out the window. But what we were able to do with him was to help create a sense of consistent, predictable routine, which um, in and of itself was a protective factor for him. And apologies if I'm speaking really fast. I'm trying to I once did this presentation as a 35 minute presentation and I'm trying to do it in 20. So I am maybe talking a bit fast, sorry about that. So um, with consistent predictable routine for digital youth work, the question is, you know, when do your doors open and how do young people know that they are? So with the youth center, we were able to create consistent predictable routine by young people knowing from 3 p.m. till 6.30, the youth center doors are open and they could expect who was going to be there as well. They knew the culture that they were walking into. They knew what activities they could um, anticipate and they had a consistent, predictable routine. Uh, so my question for you as you're planning any digital youth work activities is what does consistent, predictable routine look like? And how is that communicated to young people? With the youth center, they knew that the, uh, all the lights would be on, the door would be open and our sign would be on the road. Uh, so what does the same thing look like for you? Um, so that's one point. The next, I, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, speed through it and not completely address it. And maybe if you wanna ask more, you could ask more in the questions. But basically uh, a youth worker's role in a drop-in is to help form the culture and actually a protective factor for young people. Um, so a youth worker's role in a drop-in is to set the right environment for community amongst youth to flourish. So it's not just youth worker to young person, but it's young person to young person in a, a culture that the youth workers have set. Uh, so um, yeah, successful drop-ins are just as much about sp providing spaces for healthy peer-to-peer -peer connection as they are about connecting youth workers, um, connecting with youth workers or activities. So uh, my question for digital youth work is, 
what does this look like? How can you create uh, the culture within that space to facilitate healthy peer-to-peer -peer connections? Uh, so that's the second thing that I would say. And then this is uh, moving to the third, uh, moving to the third lesson from running a successful drop-in is this. Dude, we haven't seen you in a while. What's been happening? Afternoon hangs hasn't been the same without you. And this is a conversation that we would have over and over with young people uh, at our drop-in centre. And this, in many ways, is Youth Work 101. Young people need people in their lives who they know care about them. And these are people who notice when they aren't there and follow up with genuine care. Sometimes, and not all the time, but sometimes when a young person hasn't shown up to a youth center or shown up to your program for a while, it is a bid. Sometimes it is them asking the question, do you genuinely care? And as youth workers, we're trained to look out for uh, young people saying offhand comments, which mean they want to dig deeper into that issue, but they don't know how to talk about it, uh, or specific behaviors that are a bid, a bid for uh, attention, but a bid for you to connect and engage with them. But sometimes young people, even if it's subconsciously, use not showing up as a bid. And I think this is particularly important for us with digital youth work is young people that have been engaging that aren't digitally, how can we make sure that we follow up with them because potentially uh, that is a bid as well. So based on all of that, we want to quickly take some time to look at creating some aims for digital youth work. And I know that, so this uh, initially was created at the beginning of lockdown, and I know that things have moved within that time, but I think these points are still really relevant for any youth work, online youth work activities. So I would say that the first thing you want to achieve with digital youth work is maintain fun, engaging, regular activities for young people as a protective factor during this time. Uh, as we talked about, you know, young people have all of these risk factors in their life and as strengths-based practitioners, what we do is try build uh, as many protective factors. So uh, this is by providing fun, engaging, regular activities for young people that then help build those protective factors. The second thing is uh, to maintain positive therapeutic connections with young people, again, as a protective factor. And in this case, we're talking about youth worker to young person connections. And then the third thing is to provide positive, healthy spaces for peer to peer connection during this time. Uh, and I'm excited about the outlook of youth work beyond COVID-19 and beyond lockdown for what digital youth work can look like for all of these things as well. Um, so that's the uh, next thing is that positive peer-to-peer -peer connection and how can we as youth workers set the environment for that to happen. So what I'm gonna jump to now is um, just looking at my timer. I whizzed through that. Sorry if I talked really fast. Uh, what we're gonna to get to now is uh, creating a framework for digital youth work activities. And hopefully this is just something really practical that you and your team could use. Potentially uh, some of you have already downloaded the guide and you've seen this, uh, but this could be a good refresher. So we're just gonna get into that. So uh, you can go to youthwork.io, um, which uh, here, this is the homepage and you can get the digital youth work a practical non-techie guide. Uh, in here, there's sort of a bit about it. Um, and you just need to click get the PDF guide to get the full version. Um, this is my favorite meme from the COVID-19 times. Uh, you know, let's see what's behind COVID-19. It was Zoom and here we are all on, on Zoom. But um, yeah, all of a sudden, uh, it was amazing to see uh, people move from early adopters to the late majority, if anyone knows uh, 
that idea of adoption uh, so quickly. Uh, anyway, so this is the guide and there's a whole lot of really helpful stuff in here. Um, so if you jump through it, you know, it has what I've already talked about, getting clear on what we want to achieve. Um, here are some ideas for digital youth work, uh, but it moves down into um, what I already have up here to create your digital youth work activity plan in three simple steps. So the first thing is something uh, that we came up with, which is the um, digital youth work activity matrix. So essentially it breaks up um, online youth work into a small range of things. So on this matrix, we have one-on-one uh, -on -one connection and one-on-one -on -one engagement. So uh, for the purpose of this, we know that uh, it's a bit of a blunt instrument, but it's helpful for uh, creating a bit of an activity plan. So one-on-one um, -on -one connection, uh, connection is in this context is more conversation based whereas engagement is activity based. So if we have one-on-one -on -one connection, uh, it's maybe a messenger chat that you have with young people. And then one-on-one -on -one engagement, you might have uh, a young brainiac who loves to play chess. Uh, so maybe that's one-on-one -on -one playing chess. But then for group connection, you could organize a video call where you talk about what's on top, what's been happening with you, uh, and simply just connect. But maybe you wanna do uh, some group engagement where you say, hey, we're gonna play some games. And maybe you have an hour and a half where you do a, a, a mixture of these things, whatever it happens to be. What this matrix does is help you see what you are doing and plan what you could do as well. So if you jump from there into this, there's the activity matrix worksheet, which is blank. You could print it out. I encourage you look at it like a structured brainstorm and, um, uh, grab some colored pens. I always love color because it helps bring out the creativity and plan out, not at the stage, what tools are you going to use, but uh, be thinking about what ac sort of activities do you want to be doing and where do they sit within this? Um, and by doing this, I think you'll be able to create a comprehensive approach to your digital youth work. Uh, so the second step, once you've done that uh, structured brainstorm, is jump in here is to input your uh, your matrix into the digital youth work planning guide. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So um, once you've got the guide from youthwork.io, you can click here and we're just going to have to give it a minute. And it's going to ask to copy this document. So I'm going to make a copy. So to do this, you need a Gmail account. Uh, this is powered through Google Docs. So we've already got some examples up here. So what we have is um, we're going to go, okay, for one-on-one -on -one engagement, uh, where engagement is activity-based, uh, we've put in online chess. And then it's going to ask in this next column, what tool are you going to use? At this stage, it's about, okay, what's the tool? Uh, so I love chess.com. If anyone wants to play chess with me, let me know in the chat. Uh, and then here you can just click in this drop down menu. Um, weekly, daily, monthly, or are you going to do this as a one off? And you can see uh, you're going to have chat messages at, for one on one connection. You're going to do that with Facebook Messenger. And I'm, we're going to plan to do that daily. Uh, and then uh, same here, it goes into group engagement and connection. I've got one minute left, so I'm just going to make sure I whiz through this. Um, this then breaks this up into, it pulls the information from this tab into here. Uh, so you can look at what daily activities do you have and where do they sit? Uh, when it says NA, that means we haven't inputted uh, an activity there for daily activities. Uh, and at this point you can um, help bring that towards your team as well. You know, who is responsible for this? And then that's the same for weekly activities and monthly activities and one off. Then um, this is the example monthly planner. So then from there, this part isn't uh, automated. You have to go through and do this one by one, but you could go, we're gonna have, we said we would do chat messages 
daily. So we're going to put that one-on-one -on -one connection in daily. Uh, and we're going to put that in across the entire month. And then we could go back to monthly activities. Uh, and we were going to do a seven-day photo challenge. Uh, so then we go, okay, in this four-week planner, where are we going to do that? And so what this does in this three steps model, essentially, is it helps you go from your, um, where was it? Oh, um, your structured brainstorm here uh, within a few steps to actually get a monthly planner that breaks it down and you know what tools you're going to use. So I hope that that is um, uh, just a helpful guide for getting started. Or if you have already got started, uh, potentially it is a helpful way to, for you to keep moving. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I've stopped sharing my screen and um, I'm here to take any questions that you have. Maybe I'll jump back to you, Sam, if you want to jump in. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much, James. Um, I'd just like to thank you for a giving up your time and being here and, and just being so open with the approach that you've taken. Like I, I just um, blown away slightly about the kind of open source nature of your resources, which is just not an approach mm. that a lot of places and, and people take. Um, and I think you yeah. deserve a lot of respect and, and thanks for that. Um, and likewise, the, the the practical nature of it as well. It isn't just principles and, and abstract concepts, but step-by-step but -step guides with suggestions mm. at every turn. So um, mm. I, I'm pretty sure people are gonna find it useful if they haven't already found it. I have shared it um, over the last few months since I discovered it as well, but mm. I'm sure there'll be a lot of yeah. people that have, have seen this for the first time today. Um, has any, uh, I can see a couple of questions coming through on the chat. Um, what is the ratio like as in how many youths do you have coming in versus how many volunteer staff do you have working with them? Um, that's kind of interesting, I guess. Have you got any experience, James, of, 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 of how you um, kind of uh, uh, like staffing capacity around um, mm. approaching online uh, delivery, digital delivery? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think it's really important, and again, jumping back to uh, thinking about the youth center that I was at, is we're not trying to recreate youth work, we're just doing it in a new way, and we're doing it with a new, um, a new vehicle, essentially. And so the way, I would say, uh, the way that it worked for you in person, um, you're trying to, in some ways, kind of recreate that. You're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So you'll be able to figure that out for yourself. As a general rule at our youth centre, we would um, make sure that young people were split up between the different youth workers. Often there was the one or two young people that were really easy to get along with. And uh, after a few months, we realised we were all spending all our time with the same young person and other people were walking in the door and out without us noticing. And so I think it's really important to be able to try spread your team uh, across young people, especially when you're talking about maybe checking in with daily messages, things like that. Unless you're really intentional about it, it could be quite easy to miss people. So I would just say, um, try be intentional with how you spread out those connections. But um, just trust your gut and go with what was working in person and try bring that into a digital space. Um. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions that, that people have got for James? Um, Feel free to pop them in the chat or take yourself off mute if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, hi, James. I'm Rita. Um, I'm the FECA's youth chair uh, from Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia. Um, my question was like, what if you as a youth worker want to take your off, yourself off social media? And you can't do that because it's COVID-19 and everything is yeah. online. And yeah. it, it could be that, you know, you yourself have like, cyberbullying or you just want to kind of get rid of Facebook because it's just too much so is there yeah. any tips that we can overcome with that I mean some people say oh you can use your organization's Facebook but that's where the communication teams handles that as a youth yeah, worker I yeah. don't have access to that so any mm, tips on that mm. thanks yeah um some people create I would advise against because youth work is um as a relational um as a relational practice, 
I would encourage you to have a personalized Facebook, even if it is James Harris Youth Worker as my Facebook, uh, and be thinking of that as a tool, you know, as your vehicle to connect. So say um, I'm really similar. I find I get sucked into the vortex of um, a news feed and I can, I can lose myself and it's really bad for my mindfulness practice uh, and can be really bad for my own mental health. So I do my best to use Facebook as a tool and then get off it. Um, but I would say that in this time, uh, you can go a few different routes. You can, your organization could decide it's okay to use your personal uh, accounts, or you might say, hey, let's you create work ones. If you create work accounts, I would say, um, try and make it like you are a person on there, you, rather than someone talking to, uh, you know, like something youth zone. You know, it's like, no, they're talking to James from youth zone and making it because at the end of the day we're not trying to recreate youth work we're just doing it with a new medium that would be my suggestion does that make sense or any follow-up question uh yeah that that does make sense because i feel like i've been on facebook for 10 years and i've got all my history my friends my family and my yep. massive youth network there and if i get rid of that just because of cyberbullying or you know, people going on degrading or whatever, then I feel like I'm, I'm, what about the young people that are actually out there listening and following and getting inspired mm. as opposed to, you know, a yeah. uh, couple of other stuff. But um, I have decided to create my website just, just as a, other than LinkedIn, I've just also decided to create yeah. a website just in case if things get too much on Facebook and I can just hop onto my website. Uh, but yes, uh, Facebook is still the yeah. primarily network uh, to engage with mm. young people for me. Uh, some people do yeah. use Instagram, but I, I, yeah. I think that it, it, there is still my generation young, People in their 20s are still on Facebook. People in their teens yeah. are on Instagram. So there's a little bit of yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, imbalance there. But thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we should just not give up on our youth, I think. <laughs> mm. yeah. And a few practical tips on that. There's um, a really great, great Google Chrome extension called Kill Newsfeed. And it means that you can still go to Facebook groups and messages and pages, but you don't have your newsfeed. Um, so if you're using Facebook during work time, especially, it's a really helpful thing. If you're going, Hey, I'm going to go post on this group of young people without getting sucked into the vortex of, even for me, I find the news quite depressing at the moment. So it can be, um, not all of it, some of it, um, I can get sucked into that. And, it, um, so kill newsfeed also, um, I always, um, if I'm going to message a young person or anyone actually, I go to messenger.com rather than facebook.com to send the message. And that way it's just your, just messages. Um, so those are just some like practical tips for me that I've uh, has been helpful to avoid everything else that comes with Facebook um, when trying to use it as a tool for youth work has been helpful. Uh, another thing to say about Facebook and Instagram is that Facebook have announced that they're working to integrate Facebook like it's all going to be messenger one day with that so that's sort of what we can expect probably within the next year to 18 months is that Instagram messages and Facebook messages are actually the same thing um, which I'm looking forward to yeah great um that yeah thanks for the heads up i don't know how you know that james but that's good to know um one last question before we move on to emily um talia who works at plan international is doing some great work with um, youth activists at the moment she's put it in the chat there and she said i think sometimes in the current times i find it difficult to find the balance between engagement and checking in and letting them have some time to step away i've asked them each individually mm. how they'd like to engage communicate with them it's totally okay to step back at this time and general checking around well-being do you have any other kind of reflections or, or tips on on that balance which i think is a key question yeah um that is a really, really good question. And I think it's a, um, it's a hard time. 
like there's there's COVID nineteen uh, in Australia um, where we're grieving everyone who has died uh, since you know the nineteen ninety one Royal Commission, uh, and we're seeing continually uh, what is happening, uh, and it's on the news and it's it's in our face um, more than it has been as Aboriginal people. Uh, it's in your face all the time, but um, I think for a lot of people, it's um, it's good that they're confronted by it. Um, and then there's, but it is there's that there's obviously Black Lives Matter uh, throughout the world. There's so much that is happening, and sometimes, especially with youth activism, uh, I'm involved with a young group that are push a group of young people that are pushing for a modern slavery act in New Zealand at the moment. And some of the things that they were getting back from uh, people were like are uh, like another thing, you know, like not in um, not in a bad way, but in a like, it's just so heavy at the moment. And I think especially young people that are prone towards activism uh, um, and and have are pushing for justice are holding like the weight of the world on their shoulders a bit. So um, I kind of first just want to say that to just say I hear you um, and know that that's it's a really difficult time. Uh, I think as youth workers, uh, our primary thing is relationship. And at the end of the day, it's really about um, whatever vehicle we're using for that. If you're gonna be using Facebook, I think Facebook's great because a lot of people are there, but if people are trying to disengage from it, maybe that's where you go, hey, let's just like schedule a phone call once a week where we chat for 20 minutes um, or other mediums that don't pull them into the vortex of social media that includes everything else. Um, or maybe saying to them, you know, hey, um, if you want to get off Facebook, you can still stay on Messenger uh, and maybe we can connect there. Whatever that happens to be, um, I think somehow trying to keep up that relationship. Uh, but yeah, often we use social media because that's where young people already are. But if they're going to be somewhere else, it's just meeting them there. That would be my um, thoughts. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, James. Um, and I think it's it's a really rich ground for conversation around social media and, and youth work and the crossovers. Um, it might be something we want to car park and, and kind of come back to at a different meeting um, and dedicate some specific time to it. But um, thank you so much, James, for your time and your input. I know you're planning to stick around um, for the rest of the meeting today and jump into one of the breakout groups later. So um, yeah, well, thank you again towards the end. But um, at this point, what we'll do is pass over to Emily Greco. So Emily's um, part of the YPPN. She has been for over a year now. Uh, she's currently the content development manager for the new virtual Y youth space. Is heading up a team who've created the purpose-built digital youth space for young people, which I believe has launched in the last couple of weeks. So we're very lucky to have her talking um, right off the back of that um, and giving us some insights to the learnings that her and the, the team at the Y have gone through. So I will pass over to Emily. Um, if you're set to go, Emily. Uh, yes. <laughs> no worries. Clicking my presentation. <laughs> Full screen so everyone can see it. Okay, great, excellent. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Emily. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm currently uh, the Digital Content Development Manager at The Y, formerly known as YMCA Victoria. So um, if you're not quite up with the, that change that recently happened uh, last year, uh, that is who we are. Um, so uh, what I'd love to do before we start, though, um, is I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am presenting from today, and that's the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation, and pay my personal respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people uh, that might be joining us today. I want to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as are the First Nations people of Australia and they never ceded sovereignty and remain strong in their enduring connection to land and black culture. And I'd also like to uh, stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I have been uh, involved with the YMCA for approximately 15 years, uh, but we recently had a pivot, as everyone else uh, has, because 
of COVID-19. And today, um, what I'd love to talk to you about is what our digital youth space has looked like. So uh, this has been built in a matter of three months. Um, and when I start to talk about it and talk about sort of the scale that we've gotten to and, and where we're headed, it is quite amazing. But it's taught us that sometimes it takes a pandemic uh, to, for people to have to be agile and to create some amazing things. But I also think during the creation process, there's actually a lot of learnings uh, that we can share with a lot of youth work organisations out there, uh, because I think a lot of people could create something like this, even if it's not to the scale that we've created it. Uh, but I think the learnings come from the story of the site and how we put it together and where it's evolved to and where it's evolving uh, to in the future. And it all starts um, with what I'd like to talk about is this project timeline. So uh, pre-COVID, most of our services, so most of our youth services, if, if you weren't unaware, uh, was face-to-face -face and a majority of those were actually residential. Uh, so once COVID sort of came and everything got shut down, we basically lost 90% of our operations. So that included our central youth services, but it also included uh, our gyms, our pools, our childcare centres were still operational, but at a very limited capacity as people started to pull their children out of childcare. And so our revenue streams were basically drying up within the span of three to four days. We did have some youth services still operating because some of our youth services are funded uh, differently, different models, such as our regional hubs. And so what that basically meant is those regional hubs that were still alive, they pivoted to online delivery uh, via Facebook. And through that online delivery, um, we also had our volunteer youth space as well, which went online within a matter of I'd say 24 hours. Uh, so we were told on the 18th of March that we needed to go home. And then on the 19th of March, basically everything got shut down and we had to pop up online. So a lot of that happened with just good old grassroots youth working uh, is what I like to call it. And a lot of people using their creativity and the skills that they already had inherit to then work through their Facebooks. Uh, so our Facebooks, as we all spoke about with social media, all came alive. Our central youth services was actually being run by 95% volunteers uh, to keep that volunteer culture and that youth work culture alive. Uh, we also had our regional hubs in Latrobe and the Peninsula and also in Bendigo operational. Uh, and the work they were doing was great gaining real traction. So over April, uh, we were getting a lot of youth engagement in our online content, in our one-to-one -one sessions, in our group work sessions. Uh, and this was mostly just, you know, youth workers doing what they're good at and trying to fill a space that there desperately was needed uh, because a lot of youth programs and youth centres and our central youth services were shut down. What this meant though is we actually had a snapshot and we had a working model that we could go uh, to the Victorian government with and apply for government funding for a larger project, so a larger answer to youth work. Uh, because we had a model that was working through our regional hubs and through our volunteers, we knew what young people were responding to, what they liked, what they didn't like, um, where our engagement was. And we actually used all of that data uh, from this sort of hodgepodge collection of youth work that had come really, as I said, from that grassroots level uh, to create a really uh, great application to uh, the Victorian government uh, for funding. Then a wonderful news, uh, late April, we received that funding, which was really, really exciting. And so then the plan began uh, for a purpose-built online youth space. And then what we needed to do was utilise current assets, partnerships and data uh, to create what you're about to see. Uh, in May, the team was brought back on uh, to build this site um, and also to build a central youth space as well. And then I'll talk about the future. So from where it sort of began to, you know, a couple of, basically a couple of youth workers uh, on Facebook doing what they do well uh, to then receiving the grant to then created the virtual why. Uh, and so I wanna talk you through the actual website and 
how we decided to get where we got. But the journey, I think, to get there is probably uh, the most interesting thing out of all of it. So uh, this is virtual Y. So as you can see, um, we have a few different areas of the Y. Uh, and today I'm going to focus predominantly on the youth space. So what we learned from our data and what we understood that was working in our regional youth hubs is that there had to be four separate ways of referral of content. So we wanted static content. So that was content that young people could actually go and see any time when they needed to support. You know, they could look at it at midnight, they could look at it at six o'clock in the morning, and we could create all of that to live somewhere for them to see. But then you know, as James was saying, nothing really replaces that human interaction. So we wanted to create two different areas of interaction where young people could work with us. And one of them was live. So that is actually going out live where people can comment on Facebook and watch things as they're happening and be really engaged. And then there's the real crux of youth work, which is that interactive. So actually sitting down with a group of young people, always on Zoom or something like that, and having... Uh, those conversations. And then lastly was referral. So something that the Y never purports to be is experts in mental health and wellbeing. Uh, that is not the game that we play in, I like to say. Uh, we understand that there are organization, organizations out there that do that side of clinical care a lot, lot better than us. And we knew that we would have young people coming to us through the uh, COVID and also just the youth work that we were doing day to day that might need that specific clinical care. So it was really important for us for our new youth space to have a referral line. So if we had young people coming to us who did need that extra help and that professional care, then we had a line out to referral services that we could send them to uh, to give them what they needed. So there were basically the four elements uh, that we needed to build in the span of basically four weeks. <laughs> So what we also found from the data is uh, we needed to understand what people need. Uh, so for this, we did our own market research, but we also used uh, some of Yakvik's research that they did uh, coming very recently, uh, early on in the pandemic. And we decided that out of the four things that we wanted to provide youth, uh, these were it. Uh, so one was social connections. So obviously, especially during the height of the lockdown, trying to connect people, but also even now connecting people because they might not feel safe exiting their homes uh, and doing that sort of thing. The next is skill development. So employment is a real worry uh, for young people. So what can we do to help their skill development? And also, if possible, how can we give young people employment during this time as well? Mental well-being uh, is definitely a big one, and we come at it, at it from a strengths approach. Um, so positive things that you can actually do to improve your mental well-being instead of coming at it from a clinical mental health side of things, because again, we uh, are not experts in that area. And physical well-being, the why being who we are, we are very uh, intent on ensuring people live happy, happy and healthy lives, and so ensuring their physicality and their physical well-being is important. And and so they're the, the four buckets that we want our youth space to actually uh, create or provide. So social connection. So how are we actually doing that? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, the first way we're doing that is through our interactive sessions. Uh, and that's probably the major way that we're providing interactive. So this is our youth space uh, down in Latrobe. And as you can see, some of the big things that they're doing uh, is things like the Young Parents Group, the Rainbow Club, Movie and Drama Club, the news club. So these are Zooms uh, where groups of young people get together with you, youth workers on the line and they participate in these type of interactive webinars like we're doing today. And so that's a really big part of our social connection bucket. And this is happening at all of our regional youth hubs. And we decided to concentrate on the regional youth hubs for our interactives because that's where we have a captive audience. It's very, very hard just to capture young people from Victoria and say, hey, come to this interactive webinar. Uh, but it is a lot easier to target that in regional areas. And so that's where we've concentrated a lot of our interactive work. Then we have our lives. 
Uh, so these are going out on our Facebook page uh, and they're also on the Virtual Y website. And these are young people, uh, middle-aged people, older people, all sorts of people uh, doing interactive sessions where people can participate together at a certain time. And these were really popular at the height uh, of COVID. We had a tagline, why isolation, uh, which we were using. And, you know, we were getting a lot of engagement, a lot of comments and, and a lot of fun during that time. So uh, these are some of the examples of our live content, such as Pilates, um, making music, why isolation, aerobics, painting, uh, and these continue to uh, go all week. We have three live sessions a week. Then we also have the Y Challenge. So the Y Challenge is interactive in the sense that it's asking young people to come back to us. Um, so each week we're going to be putting out a challenge that we want young people to do in their homes, with their friends, with their family, of course, at a safe social distance. And then we're going to get them to post that on social media. And then there will be prizes uh, for the young people who participate in this. And this is to get people thinking about other things and what's going on, but also getting them socially connected with their own networks. Each challenge uh, as they uh, launch, you'll see, have a different area of expertise in one of those buckets, but also a design to be done with other people so we can get people socially connecting again. So then we have uh, skill development. So. For this one, what we decided to do is static content would work the best in skill development. So what we got is our staff, our young staff and our older staff uh, to create what we call static content that is then uploaded onto our learning page and young people can come and access this page at any time. And what we've actually found is a twofold benefit from this. So one of the benefits is that the people actually watching will gain a skill from watching these videos but the feedback that we've actually received from young people who've had to sit down, write a session plan, uh, get some film software, whether it be on their phones, on their laptop, actually film something, sit down and edit it, send it to us. The skill development that the young people have actually had in creating the videos has been a side benefit that we didn't actually think would come to fruition when we first had the idea. So we're connecting young people to their skills. And for this, we're also being able to pay them, which has been really, really important because a lot of young people at the Y have unfortunately lost shifts at our gyms and pools. And so this has given us an area where we've been able to employ them or redeploy them to create um, some of this skill for us. So it's really helped build our youth space um, because the YMCA, you know, we've for a long time been by young people for young people. We think that young people know what they want. So why don't you ask the young people to then create it? And that's one of the, the big facets of our youth participation model. Uh, and so, yeah, this is coming through. This is going to last all the way until September. We have more young people creating, submitting, editing content. Um, and so it's been a, quite an amazing part of the virtual Y build uh, that has happened quite organically. Uh, then we have something called resource of the day. And I think this video sort of explains what resource of the day is better than me. So I uh, will play it for you. We're incredibly lucky to have access to so many online resources during this challenging time. Yeah, have you seen the compilation video of those bats eating the watermelon? I mean resources with educational benefits, Kerch. With so much out there, it's hard to find websites and apps with quality content that are both free and easy to use. I hear you and the struggle is real. To support families staying at home during the COVID-19 pandemic, The Why will be showcasing some of the best free online resources to keep young people feeling inspired, engaged and connected. We're calling it Resource of the Day. Gee, that's original. How about run resources or like positively viral or... Oh, we keep it simple. The Resource of the Day will be posted across the Wise social media pages three times a week. Each post will introduce a website or app, how to use it and what can be achieved. Yeah, I guess. Like keeping it simple reduces the time that it takes to locate the resource and then find find out whether or not it's suitable. Exactly! With the information provided, you'll know if it's for you in under 60 seconds. Wow! That's faster than my bad eating watermelon video. Good. I think it's time you checked out resource of the day. You can even try one of the optional
challenges to help you explore a resource and interact with others who are doing the same. Already onto it. Downloading your language app now so I can learn Spanish. Hasta la vista, daddy. Huh? Never mind. I'm just glad that you discovered a new resource. So they are two of our amazing youth workers who put that together. Um, it might look very snazzy, but, you know, it's filmed with some basic-ish equipment uh, and edited by our internal editors at home. But also, you know, we can, what you can create with what you have sometimes can be pretty exciting. But resource of the day, it, like Kurgeon and um, Casey explained, it's an area where young people can go to sort of cut through all the craziness that's happening with all the resources and actually see, you know, find educational content that they can use. And so for that, we really want to highlight other organisations. Uh, so James, for example, uh, we used your write a COVID letter time capsule as one of our referral resources that we really loved. Uh, we're referring people to Headspace, to Canva, so to other organisations that we think uh, are doing an amazing job in this space and pe young people should be connected through in this time. And then lastly, uh, we have well-being. So again, we've come at this from two points of view. We've got static content where young people can come and look at static content where they can enhance their well-being. Again, coming at it from a positives and strengths approach. Uh, and this is also all created by young people, for young people. And then we've got our mental well-being uh, framework. So this is basically to ensure that the young people who are coming to our service are being supported in the best way possible. And there's a few ways we're doing that. So the first one is through live moderation. So during our live and interactive sessions, these are always monitored by youth workers to ensure that any young people who might need help or assistance are able to be followed up with. We have a youth space code of conduct, uh, which is an area where young people will be able to go and it's a succinct and digestible explanation for young people to clearly identify the online expectations which they're involved in in virtual wine. A wellbeing corner. So this is an area on the website that is very specific uh, that will detail how young people can actually access support. Uh, so if they're struggling, they have somewhere where they can go, fill in their details, and then we can actually get in touch with them. And if it's not something that's in our area of expertise, uh, we can then pass that on to the experts. We're also uh, hopefully training all of our facilitators on mental health and well-being and what are the, some of the signs and symptoms to look out for and when someone might be struggling with their mental health. And we're also going to hopefully extend that out to young people in the future. And facilitator support. So all of those young people that were creating those videos, uh, we've created a community to actually get them together and working together to create new content for young people, but also supporting them if that content that they're creating might be bringing up something for them that they need some extra support with. And so this is tied into the whole holistic approach of the website. Okay, so I think, uh, oh, and move, sorry. Um, of course, us being uh, the YMCA, we love fitness and we want young people to be physically healthy. And so we've got the young people uh, who will be able to participate in our health and fitness classes. And so these are live health and fitness classes that young people can come to uh, or do core Pilates or do some ab work. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, and what we also want to announce today, uh, which is a scoop for the people on this meeting, is uh, we have a new area on the website, which is a uh, advocacy and youth voice space. So this is something that we're really excited about. Uh, and it's going to be an area of the website where we have this vision that we want young people uh, to be able to use, the, use their voice. And then we want to elevate that uh, to the powers that be, whether it be ministers or local councils. What this looks like, uh, we haven't actually decided. Uh, we do have a team of young people and youth workers together who are currently talking about what this could look like, like in the future. Uh, but we're very excited uh, as this is kind of our next step, our next evolution of our youth space. So, um, learnings. 
Uh, first one is you can achieve more than you would expect in a very limited time frame. Uh, so this whole website was basically built uh, in a matter of a couple of months, really, in terms of a month for the back build, but then a month putting together all of the content and the interactive sessions that you've seen, all of the live sessions, the facilitators. So, you know, if you would have told us that three, four weeks ago that this is what the product we would have had at the end, uh, I wouldn't have believed you, but it is definitely doable. Um, the use space is a continual work in progress. We're changing things absolutely every day, but it doesn't have to be perfect to start. So when we began our little timetables and our Facebooks out to young people, just grassroots youth work, it, we wouldn't think it would have come into what it is today. But if we hadn't have started there, we wouldn't have created what we had today. So if you've got an idea or you just need to give it a go, uh, then start because you don't know what that's eventually going to morph into. It could be something pretty exciting. Another one, importance of true agility in youth work. Um, our youth services was the quickest to pivot in the post-COVID world. Uh, some of our other areas of the organisation weren't able uh, to pivot as quickly as us. Uh, and this is where we've ended up in sort of an area that has, again, created something pretty exciting. So it, it is really important to sometimes be agile and also understand and ask the young people that you're working with what they want. Um, also, we've got the individual accountability and collective responsibility. And for us, that's because every single person working on this project wants it to succeed. So even though we've got our individual goals, really, uh, you know, you could pass that goal on to any single person in the team and they would go at that goal as hard and as fast as any other person in the team. And so we've really uh, begin to learn the value of that. And the last one is a real simple one. And that's fact that, you know, we haven't lost sight of who we are as an organisation, the fun factor. So, you know, if you watch some of our static content, it's filmed as people's lounge rooms. It's a bit silly. It's a bit fun. But for us, that's who we are. And we really understand that. And we understand the value that we can bring young people. And we've never tried to be something different to that. We've never tried to be experts in mental health because we understand we're not. We have never tried to, you know, have all of our videos be really swanky and fun because that way young people probably weren't, wouldn't have been able to participate. So it's really important that even through all of this, you don't lose sight of who you are as an organisation and you bring what you uh, as an organisation can bring because that's all young people need. I think that's it. I will stop sharing now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, what a great presentation and talking us through the whole uh, process from um, before COVID uh, right through to, to what you've managed to create over the last couple of months. Like it's, it's seriously impressive. Um, I am aware that a few people are going to be dropping off um, soon. So please do um, check out our upcoming webinars. Uh, we've got an inclusive we uh, Zoom meetings webinar next week, which is being um, co-hosted with us and the Youth Disability Advocacy Service um, and Daru team from um, uh, VCOS. That's next week. Um, I wanted to shout out around um, Commission for Children and Young People Youth Forums um, that are happening next week as well. There's a link in the chat box there. And please do complete the evaluation for this webinar if you do need to head off in the next few minutes. And um, Mick from the Y also posted a bit of information there. If you've got any interesting resources that you'd like to share with young people via the virtual Y site, um, let him know as well. Um, are there any questions for Emily? Um, I didn't see any come in through the chat, but I might have missed some. Um, Nerea, feel free to take yourself off uh, mute if there are any questions you've noticed or noted. Um, and likewise, if there's anyone else that wants to ask Emily a specific question, feel free to go now. Well, that is okay. Um, we'll take, oh, how are you ensuring the online space is inclusive uh, to, with uh, in regards to diversity and abilities? Uh, that's a great question um, from Rebecca Whittlesey Youth Services. Emily? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a couple of um, uh, lenses, I guess we're putting on it. Um, one of the big ones is our disability lens. Uh, because the YMCA is fortunate to work in disability, uh, we do have our disability and inclusion coordinator who is in charge of uh, one of the buckets. And so what she does, I think she's on the line or she was on the line, <laughs> uh, is looks at all of our uh, challenges, our content, and basically lets us know from an accessibility point of view uh, where that basically sits and how we can make that more accessible. And we use that feedback to uh, create new content. Uh, in terms of um, diversity, uh, was that one of the questions? Diversity, uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, so basically what we're using is our uh, current pool of young people to help us through our diversity lens as well and so we're going into young people that we work with and asking you know what content did they want to see who did they want to see represented um can they be a representative of their community and send us through something that they think their community is really going to benefit from uh, we have really active engagement um, with a couple of diverse communities and also disability communities uh, that we're getting content from. Uh, you'll see in a couple of challenges coming up, we have representation from the deaf community. So we're basically using our current contacts and resources, uh, as I said at the beginning, our current asset management uh, to get in touch with those communities and work with them. But the beautiful thing about youth space is it's ever evolving. So if you have specific contacts from certain communities that you think we're missing, we'd love to have that feedback and, and get in contact with those people. And we would love those people to create content for us because, you know, it really is what we're hoping to create, like an open sourced youth community that anyone can contribute to in the long run. So, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you, Emily. And then another question that's come through from Rachel. How are you capturing the engagement and participation? And are you getting feedback from young people along the way? And how are you doing that? Yeah, great. So we have two mechanisms to do that. Uh, well, the first is the website analytics. Um, so when you do go to the website, it's 100% free, um, but you do have to sign up. And so we are getting data analytics from the sign up. We are asking age uh, and also, I think that's it. Uh, and so we are seeing where our age range, so our youth 12 to 25, where they're spending their time, for how long, um, so we can get Google Analytics of, you know, what websites they're going on to and where they're spending all of their time, what videos they're looking at. Uh, we're also collating those numbers from our interactive sessions uh, because we've got data on people who sign up to those. Uh, in terms of social impact, uh, we are beginning a social impact measurement project uh, in the next week. So what that means is the people who engage with the website will be getting a survey uh, and we'll be asking them questions about what they think about the content, what they'd like to see about the content, uh, and we go from there. Uh, but that project is taking a little bit longer just because of the complexity. But we will have both of those. So we'll have the quantitative data through our analytics through Google and we'll have the qualitative data through our social impact surveying. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, we've gone a little bit over uh, the, the time that I thought we would have for this bit. So what I might do um, is wrap it up there. I want to say a huge thank you to Emily from The Y. I want to say a huge thank you to James Harris uh, from youthwork.io. Um, and at that point, we will um, close the live feed on Facebook. So thanks so much for tuning in. Um, what we'll do in a few minutes 